Okay. The reason we're laughing is the, the lady behind the camera said I was moving so fast that I made it blurry. I don't know. Good evening, everyone. We are here for the first night of Tabernacles Amen. 2020. 2020 Tabernacles. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's been a lot said about 2020. And one of the things, of course, the obvious things people, the, uh, the obvious thing that people are saying is that here in 2020, may God give us perfect spiritual vision. And I think he's doing that. There's a lot going on in, in America and in the world today. And I think that people's eyes are being opened up. I think that some people who used to not are now seeing 2020, or at least closer to it. Amen. Amen? Yes. I think they are. Uh, it's just so obvious now what's going on in the world. But this Tabernacles, we want to focus on the Feast of Tabernacles. We want to focus on what this means to us. The Feasts of the Lord teach us about God, what His plan is, what He's doing, what He's done, what He will do. And we come now to the Feast of Tabernacles, which was and is one of the feasts of the Lord, which God gave to his people, Israel. Amen. Amen. He gave us these feasts. Anybody want to tell me why you think that God gave us the feasts? He tells us. It's a remembrance until he comes back. That's right. We're to teach our children, and what better way, these object lessons found in the feasts of the Lord, yes. they, uh, are, they give us a, an occasion to teach our children about God's love for us, about what he's done for us in the past and what he will do for us in the future and what he's doing for us right now. Right now we happen to be, if we were in an age, we, were in, we would be in the age of Pentecost, the, the age of the, uh, the church triumphant amen are we triumphant well we are in christ amen, amen. we are in christ you know, and that's telling every year. nice and loud so people can hear you tell every year you do it every year because every year there's new children born yes and people if forget if you don't do it every year then pretty soon you know there's gonna it's it's gonna be like the time That's one of the saddest verses in the scriptures, as far as I'm concerned. They are holy appointments, actually. Yeah. These feasts are all appointments. They yeah. are you know, and, and so on God's timeline. So the feasts of the Lord are to teach us about our great God and our relationship with him and what he's done for us, what he will do, and Amen. what he is doing. Now, I want to say something. Yes, Joseph, sir. Joseph Stalin, from his standpoint, made this statement. I'm, I'm just I'm just adding everything now. He said America is strong because it's biblically based and it's Christian. This is way back in the 1920s, early 30s. But he says, give me one generation of Americans who have not a remembrance of our history. And he said, when that happens, and if that happens, then I have a better chance of taking over America. Very said, interesting. And it seems like we are drifting in that direction. Well, we can't let it happen. No, no. We can't let it happen. We need to tell our young people about our history. We need to tell them about the feasts of God. Well, let's 
go to John chapter 1. Now, I, I would like for us to say this all together, if we could please. Uh, John chapter 1. beginning at verse 1 and going on down. All right, everybody ready? This will be our introductory scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you please be with us this evening and speak to our hearts, we pray. We ask that you please anoint these lips of clay to preach your word teach your words and give all of us eyes to see and ears to hear what you are showing us and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord amen amen, amen. now we come to the feast of tabernacles we've gone through the feast of Passover unleavened bread first fruits wonderful they tell us about the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then we went through Pentecost, which is when he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And now here recently we've celebrated the Feast of Trumpets, and then Day of Atonement, and now we come to Tabernacle. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. If someone would look that up, Zechariah 14, 16. And someone else, please look up Leviticus 23, 41. We're going to be reading about the Feast of Tabernacles. So who's got Zechariah 14, 16? Zechariah 14, verse 16. Yes, sir. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out. I'm sorry, out. is that Zechariah 14, 16? No, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Zechariah 14, 16. Okay, well, and it came to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go even up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is one of the feasts of the Lord which God gave unto his people for us to remember always, always. And then Leviticus 23, 41. In 
and ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days. Seven days. Seventh month. Now this is the seventh month. Now, I know on our calendar it's the uh, what month is this? The tenth month, first day of the tenth month. But on the Hebrew calendar, this is the seventh month, the fifteenth day of the seventh month. Now, looking back, the Feast of Tabernacles is the time of year when we celebrate the birth of our Lord. Now, uh, you may be saying, "Wait a minute." Wasn't his birthday December 25th? <laughs> no, no. No, that's, that's a day when a lot of people, most people, celebrate the birth of Jesus. But we believe he was born at the Feast of Tabernacles. All of the major th things that God did, he has a plan and all the things that he did, all the major events in Christianity, in the history of our people, always have taken place on the feast days. And the Feast of Tabernacles uh, is all about God dwelling among us. When he dwelt among us, and he will dwell among us. He dwelt among us before, and he will also in the future. Tabernacles has kind of a double fulfillment. In the, at the time we're looking back, we're looking back tonight of when Christ was born. But in the future... And we won't talk about that tonight, but in the future, there is a glorious tabernacles to come. Amen? Amen. A glorious tabernacles to come. Tonight, we're looking back at the time when our Lord Jesus Christ was born. Now, think of that. He dwelt among us. We praise his holy name for his goodness towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ came to this earth in order that he might redeem us, his people. For we so badly needed a Savior and we cannot save ourselves. According to Leviticus 25, verses 47 to 49, the, turn there with me, please. According to Leviticus 25, verses 47 to 49, if a man lost everything that he had through some great misfortune and had to sell himself as a slave, he could redeem himself. But if he didn't have the price necessary to redeem himself, he could only be bailed out and set free by a near kinsman. This is called the kinsman redemption. And it dealt with the redemption of persons and inheritance. So somebody please read Leviticus 25, verses 47 to 49. And, and if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. One of his brethren may Either redeem him. One of his kinsmen. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him. Or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. Or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Okay, so... One of his brethren may redeem him. Could be an uncle, uncle's son, cousin. Or someone who is near of kin to him could redeem him. Now this is the kinsman redemption. And as a people, we are kind of in that same predicament. As spoken of in this passage in Leviticus. Except our situation is worse because the stakes are higher. Ours is of eternal consequence. We've fallen in Adam. All of us have fallen in Adam. For as in Adam all die, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. And we've been sold as slaves under sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 14 
says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned, and all of us come short of the glory of God. We have lost everything because of our sin. We are lost. Without Christ, we are completely lost. Think back of when, before you met Christ, before Christ called you unto himself and you began that relationship with Christ, you were like walking, we were like walking dead men. We had lost everything. We had no hope. When we're not in Christ, we have no hope. Now, according to God's law, we may redeem ourselves. We just have to have the price sufficient. Sinless perfection. That's all. Just be perfectly sinless. Well, I'm not perfect, and I don't think you are either. That's the sacri- That's what we need, though. That's the price. Sinless perfection. Amen. We've lost everything. We can redeem ourselves, but we have to have the price. Amen. But we don't have the price. So we're in quite a predicament. And that's what God knew, and that's why he kinned himself to us, so that he could be our kinsman redeemer. And the reason I'm talking about it tonight is here at Tabernacles, speaking of Christ's birth and why he came, this is why he came. You know, all of time and eternity converged at the cross, but if there hadn't been a manger, there could could not have been a cross. You see what I'm saying? He kinned himself to his people. We needed a Savior. We were lost. We needed a near kinsman, somebody who could redeem us, who could pay the price, sinless perfection, to redeem us. But the kinsman redemption, certain requirements had to be met in order for a redemption to be secured. First, the Redeemer had to be a near kinsman, related by flesh and blood. That's what the near kinsman had to be, related by flesh and blood. This could really be anyone, a father, an uncle, a brother, a cousin. But God knew that none of the above had the price required. Nobody. Nobody. As we have said, all have sinned and fall short of God's perfect ideal. None of us are without blemish. Not one of us. Somebody look up Psalm chapter 53, verse 2 and 3. And then someone else, please, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. While you're looking those up, Mark chapter 10, verse 18, and Luke chapter 18, verse 19 declare... There is no one good, none good, but one, and that is God. There's none good but God. Psalm chapter 53, verses 2 to 3. Somebody read that. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them has gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. None that doeth good. No, not one. And now Romans chapter 3, verses 10, 11, and 12. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's our position. We are basically ain't nobody any good, like I said before. None of us 
is good. Only God is good. So we've fallen and we are in a place where we cannot save ourselves. That's why God kinned himself to us because he loved us and because he would keep the, the promise to, his, to our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Amen. So he came and kinned himself to us so that he could be our kinsman redeemer. So he meets the first requirement. He was born of the seed of Abraham, of, of the seed of David. Amen. He Amen. was of the tribe of Judah. Yes. He is our kinsman, our near kinsman. Yes. And as such, he represents, I suppose, all of us. And when he came he, and he kinned himself to us, that, mean, that meant that he would be the, uh, he is now able to be our kinsman redeemer. Amen. Amen. So God kinned himself to us by putting on flesh and blood. Our God became one of us in order to become our kinsman redeemer. And that's the whole reason for the manger. He met the requirement. Second, the kinsman redeemer must have the price sufficient. He cannot just be a near kinsman. He has to have the price sufficient. That price, sinless perfection. But Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the only one in all of history who absolutely was flawless in regard to God's law. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Our kinsman met this requirement. He was sinless. He was perfect. Amen. He never did anything wrong. Never now, we cannot even comprehend that because we're messing up all the time, most of us. But he did not know sin until he was on that cross and all the sins of all of us was upon him. He never knew sin. He was perfect. All the time growing up, he never sinned. As a young man, he never sinned. He came to maturity and began his ministry. Never with, he, he had no sin in his life at all. No sin. Third, he, he is our near kinsman, one. He has the price sufficient, which is a sinless life. Number three. Kinsman Redeemer must be willing to pay the price required, his life. Now this was tough, having the price sufficient was not enough. That price, that sinless life, had to be given willingly for the redemption. But Christ, was he willing to lay down his perfect sinless life to redeem us that's the question was he willing as I said earlier the stakes were high our kinsman had to lay down his life for us and we're not talking about a firing squad here or a shot in the head that would be quick we're talking about an agonizing torturous humiliating death on the cross Sin is ugly, and that sin debt is not paid without much, much pain. God kinned himself to us. He had the price required, but was he willing to pay that price? Matthew 26. Somebody get Matthew 26, verses 39 and 42. Not 39 through 42, but verse 39 and verse 42 of Matthew chapter 26.
then he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, Never, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. This is one of the most poignant scenes in the scriptures. Here is Jesus. He is our kinsman redeemer. He's our kinsman. He's candidate for kinsman redeemer. He will be our kinsman redeemer, but he is our kinsman. And he is in a position where he is about to be called upon to give his life. And here he is in the garden. And he's praying. Now his flesh did not want to die. I, you know, the flesh, he was thinking this is going to be horrible. This is going to be an agonizing, horrible death. And so his temptation, the temptation was there that he should not have to go through this. Now whatever he was thinking, we know what he said. He said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Second time he said, this cup, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. So you see there's that struggle. Now the struggle isn't the sin. Falling to the temptation, falling to the temptation, losing the struggle, losing the battle, that's where sin is. He didn't lose the battle. His flesh didn't want that. Pierced. Flogged. He didn't want it. Beaten. Mocked. The scripture says in Isaiah, he hardly looked like a human being hanging there on the cross. We read about it very clearly in the prophet Isaiah, who I believe was actually there through the eyes of prophecy and witnessed this horrible scene. We can't imagine the pain, and he knew it was coming. And so his flesh, he was our kinsman, right? He was tempted as in all points like as are we. His flesh was saying, I don't want to do this. If it's possible, his flesh said, if it's possible, let this pass from me. To be specific. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to read anything in here that isn't here. But does, can you tell that he's struggling here? He's tempted, perhaps. He got this far. He's right at the cusp. And the temptation is to not do it. But, he said, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. Amen. What do you want, God? I know he knew what, what the Father wanted. He said, If this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. So here he is. He's, he's willing to pay the price. Amen. He's our kinsman, a near kinsman. He's our near kinsman. He has the price sufficient. He is the sinless. He was the sinless Spotless Lamb of God. And now he declares, I'm willing. Amen. If this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Fourth thing, all of the above requirements having been met, he must now actually pay the price. He has to be a near kinsman. He has to have the price sufficient. He has to be willing to pay it, not coerced, willingly. Fourth, he has to pay it. 
Now, some sometimes you might be willing to do something, but you don't have to actually do it. Remember what Abraham did. Abraham put Isaac upon the altar because he was instructed to. God saw that he was willing to do it. He was about to sacrifice Isaac. And God said, nope, stop. He didn't want that to happen. He just wanted to know, is Abraham willing to do it? Our kinsman redeemer, our near kinsman, had to be willing to do it, and then he had to go ahead with it. He had to actually pay the price. He had to give his life for us. Think about that. We were talking about it before we started the recording. He gave his life for us. Now I know there's plenty of reasons that we love God. We, I know there's many reasons why I love him. Many reasons. Oh, he blesses us all the time and he, he gave and gave and gave and gives and gives and gives and provides, protects, defends. We have many, many, many reasons to love him, but why would he love us? Why would he love us? Why would he love us especially enough to give his life, to come down, put on flesh and blood, and you know he'll always be in a body. His body's glorified body now. And he will always be in a body. Think of what he sacrificed for us. I don't think, I, I know I'm not worth it. And I'm sorry, but I don't think you are either. But he did it. Greater love hath no man than this, that he give his, lay down his life for his friend. Well, I'll go beyond that. Greater love has no man than our Lord Jesus Christ because of all of the, all of the creation, out of all the creation, He is the greatest, the most wonderful, the most precious Amen. and perfect. Yes. Why would He give His life for me? He had to pay the price, and he did that. Our Lord did exactly that on the cross. He exchanged his sinless, he exchanged his sinlessness for our filthiness. And he paid the price for our redemption. He kinned himself to us. He had the price sufficient. He was willing. It was a struggle, but he was willing to pay it. And he paid it Amen. on the cross. Amen. He paid the penalty, he paid the price for our salvation, Amen. for our freedom. In Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6, I'll read that and somebody look up Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, and then someone look up Second Chronicles. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and then 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. Surely he, our Lord Jesus Christ, hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In other words, those that were watching said, He deserved it, says he's God. He deserves it. But, verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned away, every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, our Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Amen. Praise his holy name. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 9. Who's got that? Nice and loud. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I love this. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. Listen. And that while we were yet sinners. We were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. I love this passage, and I've always loved it. it. It struck me, I remember hearing it as a child when my father preached it from the pulpit. Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely will a righteous man die for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Praise his name. Second Corinthians 5.21 Nice and loud. made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He, our kinsman redeemer, has paid the price. We are now made righteous. We are set free. We are redeemed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because of what Jesus has done. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, Amen. as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you, in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be God. Our be faith God. and hope is in God. Amen. Praise his holy name. And this was something that was decided, what does it say, how long ago? Right there, before the foundation of the world. Yeah. That just adds to this. This has been decided from before the foundation of the world. Amen. And when Jesus got to the point to where it would all climax, the flesh was saying, can we do this some other way? <laughs> but nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. Our flesh will always want to take the easy way out. And only in Christ can we say no to the flesh. I think it's just, honestly, I think it's just impossible without his help yes. to say no right. to the flesh. We are fleshly beings. We're always going to go with the easiest way to do something or the most sensual, the most pleasure. We're, we're always wanting to please ourselves. Right. We want to be comfortable. We want to be taken good care of. We have to be, we have to have the help of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. By his Holy Spirit. Amen. To be able to live the life that we need to live. 
Amen. 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 All right. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ, our near kinsman, having met all the requirements of kinsman to Redeemer, has redeemed us, his near kinsman. Praise God. Yes. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 9. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Praise his holy name. The principle of this kinsman redeemer is the main theme of the Old Testament book of Ruth. Just as Boaz redeemed Ruth, Christ has redeemed us. But more than that, just as Boaz took Ruth to wife, our Lord has taken us as his bride. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are his bride. Praise his name forever. The redemption has been obtained. And we have been betrothed to our kinsman redeemer. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are married to. The wife of. God himself. God creator. The one in whom all things consist. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make you feel good? Yes. We are in Christ. Now Luke chapter 1, somebody read Luke chapter 1 beginning at verse 68. Luke chapter 1 verse 68 to 75 as we close here. Praise God, praise God Luke our chapter, kinsman redeemer. Luke chapter 1 Verse 68 to 75. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Amen. For he hath visited and redeemed his people. Hallelujah. Amen. And hath raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies. Thank you, Lord. And from the hand of all that hate us. Amen. There's a lot of them out there. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath yes. which he swore unto our father Abraham, and he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all the days of our life. Amen. Amen. This Feast of Tabernacles, as we remember the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we remember why he came. The reason why he came was why? Why did he come to the manger? To he kinned himself. He kinned himself to us. He became our near kinsman. That's why he came. Amen. Praise God. Praise. He came. He kinned himself to us. The reason for the manger, or the reason for the manger, was the cross. He came, kinned himself to us, so that he could be our kinsman redeemer. Pay the penalty. Pay the price needed that we could never pay. And to bring us back into a right relationship with him. Amen. Now coming up, looking forward, the Feast of Tabernacles points to when he will dwell among us once again. He will take the throne of his father David. And he will rule over the house of Israel, the house of Jacob, forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That is what tabernacles, the great tabernacles to come, is all about. Amen. The first Amen. tabernacles was all about, well, the tabernacles the year that Jesus came. That tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, looking back, was all about God kenning himself to us and being our near kinsman. Amen. The tabernacles in the future is all about that glorious kingdom of God on earth. Amen. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. Yes.
And it's not that far away, I'm thinking. Amen. We'll see. Thanks for listening to me. Amen. I pray you got something out of that tonight. And if you did, all glory, honor, and praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Next time.